Letting go is not easy. We understand that we should let go, let what comes in goes out. Don't let externalities affect our emotions. Um, uh, we conceptualize external objects and we emotionalize it. Uh, we know it's not right. We know, but we cannot let go. But we have to learn how to let go. And basically we cannot let go because our senses habitually attached to external objects arousing concurrent mental functions. It's not just your senses attached to external objects. At the same time, simultaneously, spontaneously, mental functions come up, like anxiety, hatred, greed, greediness, uh, jealousy, all these things come up at the same time and uh, helping you to attach to things, external, attach to externalities. It's easy to say, we, we, we should let go, but it's extremely difficult when you are in that situation. You may forget about it. You may be so habitually thinking in that way that you cannot turn back. You have to continue to be angry, continue to, be, to have hatred, to have jealousy. So it's a learning process. Letting go is not just talking about it and knowing it in words. I know the words letting go, but you really have to train yourself constantly to let go. Okay, now, when we cannot let go, because what? Because our senses interact with externalities, and at the same time, consciousness and attachments will come up. Now, this we already know, but we just want to give you some examples. Eyes interact with matter, and then there's the vision consciousness, for example, seeing an attractive object arousing sensual desires. When you, uh, when you look at uh, Google's or uh, on the internet or YouTube or Yuko or whatever, when you have all these attractive objects, you attach to it. You cannot let go of it. You continue and continue and continue. You want to go to, you, you go into the casino, you want to bet on it, you know it's not right, but you will continue and continue. It's just like drinking. You know drinking too much is no good, but you will continue. You can't let go. Ears interact with sound, addition consciousness. Uh, for example, being insulted by dirty words, arousing your anger. Nose interact with smell, giving rise to olfaction consciousness. For example, attaching to frequent smell, arising various desires, or at, uh, attaching to unwholesome, bad smell, ar arousing your anger, because your neighboring meditators, for example, um, produce very bad odor or whatever, and you don't like it, you dislike it, okay. Tongue, interact with taste, and then have to taste consciousness, for example, indulging in meat eating, leading to animal slaughtering. You like to taste um, the, the flesh of domesticated animals, chickens, ducks, goats, you know, lambs, cows, pigs. You want to eat those, fish, lobsters, crabs, because you attach to the taste, you indulge in eating them, because you've been habitually eating them. Body, interrupt with externalities, uh, with touch, whatever you touch, and producing tactility, consciousness, attaching to material luxuries, arousing greediness. Here, body attaching to externalities of touch does not mean that just this touch, a touch of a, a cold or warm or, or, or soft or hot. It's the body also interact with all luxuries and they attach to luxuries. Your body wants to drive a good car, your body wants to live in a mansion, your body wants to enjoy good things, you know, attaching. For a mind uh, interact with thoughts because you're, you create visions, you, you create, all the time you create images in your mind when you go to past memories, images in your mind when you predict futures. So you cre it's a self-created thinking object in your mind. That's the most uh, Ferocious. That's the most powerful. Not just the real realities that you look at. You also create all these realities 
illusion in reality in your mind all the time not just one time so this ears eyes nose tongue body are the easiest to deal with the most difficult to deal with is just the mind uh, because it it can interact with things that you, th you, you, you thought about many, many years ago. It can interact with things that you didn't see before. You, you just dream in your, in, in, in your mind, illusions. Uh, so, for example, attaching to past memories arousing resentment or regret, for example. So these are the at habitual attachment and this because we couldn't let go. All right, now. With this review that we already have talked about, that we always have to repeat because we always make the same mistakes. Now, let's do how to meditate. Now, when we talk about how to meditate, how to meditate is easier to talk about adjustment of the body, adjustment of the breath, how do you cross your leg, half lotus position, full lotus position, how to breathe, you know, that's the easy part, the most difficult part, is the mind, adjustment to the mind. That's the difficult part. From the perspective of mind adjustment, we have to remember two, two steps. We have to remember that we have to do what? Focus the breath. That helps the mind too, to concentrate, right? We we'll have to know, we we'll have to do what? Letting go. Two things, always remember these two things. Focus, breath, let go. When you're meditating, always remember, focus, breath, let go. Focus on your own breath. Anapanasati, right? Anapanasati, in and out breath. But how to do it though? What do we mean by that? Focus, breath, and letting go. How do you focus your breath? What's the meaning? Why focus the breath? What's the meaning of focus the breath? We always say, we meditate here and now. Focus on the here and the now. It's the present moment. It, that's your present moment awareness. Your breath is the most present. Nothing is more, impro nothing is more present than your breath, right? Is your breath in the past? It's your breath in the future. So what's the meaning of present moment awareness? That's the focus on the breath. It does not mean that, oh, I have to realize what I'm doing now. <laughs> I know, what I'm doing now, I have to realize it. No. Present moment awareness is to focus on the breath. And what is letting go? No perpetuation of habitual attachment. Why do we must have this too? Because even though you focus on your breath, you have something to work on. You work on your breath. But you're always disturbed. The honking of a car outside, put, 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 put. Then you can't focus anymore. Then you have to let go of that. It comes into your ears. The sound, externality is the sound, your ear attached to it, creating sound, listening consciousness, and you hate it, and you don't like it, you dislike it. You give, you give a commentary to it. Your internal commentators say, that's no good, no good. Dislike, like, dislike. So letting go is, let go that dislike and like. It comes in, you cannot stop it from coming in, can you? Can you stop that car honking, the sound from coming into you? No. So you no perpetuation of habitual attachment, that's the meaning of letting go. So always remember this, focus breath, let go. Why do I have to focus breath? Because that's my present moment awareness. Why do I have to let go? Because I have to break my chain of perpetual habitual attachment. And then you ask the question. Another question comes up. Why the breath? Can I do my belly button? Can I do my, a candle flame? Can I do a pond of water? Why the breath? Why? Why breath? Why did the Buddha say breath? 
Anapanasati. Your breath is the most present moment, as I said. And why the breath? It follows you wherever you go and as long as you live. Your breath follows you wherever you go. So you, wherever you go, you always have that object of meditation. Isn't it convenient? Do you have to bring the candle flame for meditation? Do you have to bring a, 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 a bowl of water? It follows you wherever you go. That's the best. Buddha picked for you the best object to focus on. And as long as you live, when you die, your breath don't have it anymore. Third, easy to remember and control. You cannot forget about your breath. How can you forget your breath? You may not notice your breath, but you cannot forget your breath. You always remember your breath. And, and you can also control it. You can stop it for a little while and continue. So actually, your breath spontaneously working in you and you have control. So third, it is the most akin to you as a focus object. It cre it's the most related to you. It has a akin, the closest. Akin means very close, very related relationship, very close relationship. It's like your son, your daughter, your, your, your mom. It's very close to you. So why don't you use your breath and you, would, you want to use a candle flame? Well, you can use a candle flame. It would be more difficult. Use whatever is akin to you. That's the reason why you can also use your, nave, your, your belly button. You can also use all the tra chakras that you have. According to the Kundalini system of meditation of yoga, you can use all these different chakras in you because it's akin to you. But you still focus on your breath and you're using your chakras because you breathe from the chakras. When, when you focus on your breath, finally, it's not just on this breath. Every pore of your skin is breathing. The breath permeates into every inch of the body. So finally, it's the breath in and out, not from here. This is one of the many ways. It's from every part of the body. So why do we let go? Why do we have to let go? Letting go break the habitual continuation of thoughts. The breath deals with the present. The past and future must be dealt with, with by letting go. You let go, you let go of the past or the future. Because your breath only deals with the present situation, not the past. Your, your, your breath is not in the past. Your breath is not in the future. The only thing to deal with the past and the future is letting go of it. It also helps to halt the egoistic self-thinking pattern that is causing suffering. When you're letting go, you don't have a self. No more manas consciousness. You don't have a self anymore. So that's the reason how, that's, that's how we meditate. So you remember, focus on the breath and let go. Whenever you meditate, you know that, oh, the Buddha said, focus, breath, letting go. If you cannot do these two things in your mental mind adjustments, you're not meditating. It's easy for body adjustments. It's easy for breath. But for the mind, the breath is related to the, to the mind, the mental adjustment too. Actually, all three are related. Adjustment to body, breath, and mind, they're all related. How can you distinctly talk about them. It's all related. It's all networking. Nothing is not related. But for, for the convenience of explanation, we want to break it into parts, into distinct items to talk about. So everybody understand this letting go concept? Focus on breath and letting go? If you read books, you have to read, you read many, many books, you come up to the same conclusion. Now I'm concluding all these for you in here. Based on this, and let's step back and look at everything together. Let's step back and look at everything together. Now, this guy is Anapana Satying. Anapana Sati, in and out breath. Anapana Sati is doing that. What did they do? 
He's having a body adjustment in here. See how this body, this body adjustment, he is also having this breath adjustment. And at the same time, what is he doing? Eyes no more matter. Eyes no more matter. Ears still, sound still comes in. Smell still comes in. Taste still comes in. Touch still comes in. As a matter of fact, matter sometimes comes in if you open your eyes. You're meditating and you open your eyes to see, oh, what time is it now? You look at the clock, your eyes interact with, with externalities. And then, what we want to do is eliminate this. No more, it's blank. Void your attachment to matter. Void your attachment to sound. No more of that. Because you let it go, right? Are you letting it go? Let go, let go, let go, it's no more. And then you say, smell. We want to avoid that, we will let go of that taste, we let go of that. We all this, we let go, right? We let go of all these, no more. No more matter, no more sound, no more spell, no more, no more taste. You have to let go of, oh, I have a breath here. You still have to let go of that breath. You have it, but you still have to let go of it. And how about thoughts? No inner commentator when you have thought. What comes in goes out. What comes in, go out. You don't put an opinion on, on honking of, of, of the car. You don't put an opinion on smelling of the laboring meditators, sweating and cologne and perfume. And you know, you have no commentation. You don't want to have. Your in, internal commentator keeps silent. You're silent, they keep, them, keep it silent. No more distorted information about yourself. Break habitual continuation of thought of the past and future. Attention only on the present breath. That's what the mind is doing. No habitual continuation of thinking about the past, about the future. No, nothing like that. And then what happened to this manas, the seven consciousness? Yourself. Because of doing all these, you let go. Where's yourself? You're, you already let go of it. Who is the one who let go? All of a sudden, this networking on you of the cell is gone. No more self. When you wake up, you still have a big self, big ego. But when you are doing this, you don't have an ego. Your ego gradually, gradually disappears. That ego creates all kinds of sufferings. That ego diminishes. Only the breath exists only the breath exists. Focus on the breath. Okay, so now you know how to meditate. All this package is complete to you. Why are you still looking in the, in the, video, in the internet for more information on, on meditate? Why are you still looking? You got it. Why do you still want to read so many, many of the books? Why do you still attach to gurus, teachers? Words. Why are you still attaching? You got enough. You already got the recipe. What you have to do is really have to roll up your sleeves and start to wash your vegetables, wash your potatoes, and start to turn on the ignite your gas and start to cook. You collect all your recipes on the table and you're not doing it. Start to do it. Don't look for any more recipes. All right, giving that information, we say, okay then, after meditating, following these methods, working, really work on your breath, letting go, focus breath, letting go, where would I go? How do I feel? What's the, what, what would I go to heaven? <laughs> would I go to, well, how, what would I, how would I feel about it? What's the result? So how do we start? We start with karma, right? We're in karma. Karma is world with desires. We're living in here. There are sentient beings who live in here. There are beings who live in here. We are very low level. We are at very low level. Animals, ghosts, you know, all kinds, they, they are in here because they have desires, sensual desires. So when you practice this, then you say, okay, we start to if we do meditation right, 
letting go and focus, what we can achieve at Kama Dattu Samadhi. Deep concentration. We can arrive in here. And as you go on and on and on, you arrive at Anagamya Samadhi. That is, the Samadhi neighboring on this Rupa Dattu. So in other words, the highest we can achieve is Anagamya Samadhi. How many people already have attained Kamadhatu Samadhi? How many people go a higher level already attain Anagamya Samadhi? Maybe one in a million? <laughs> very, very few people. Well, I don't know. There may be other people who already have achieved that. And even if you have achieved that, you can be polluted if you don't practice it. So in other words, oh, today I have one hour of achieving at this samadhi. I feel excellent. I feel pleasurable. I feel joyful. I have rapture of joy. And then you go on holiday to Turkey, Moscow, New York. You lost all of it. <laughs> you pollute it. Once you got it, it does not mean that it will, be with, will stay with you all the time. If you kill, if you lie, if you do all kinds of unwholesome deeds, or if you don't meditate anymore, you lose it. It's not something that you have and you forever, you forever have it. Because that is not experiences from deep within. You have to go to cultivation, bhavana, and you have to go to complete elimination. What the Buddha has, that's permanent, that's forever. Once you got this samadhi, for example, um, you are in the limelight of television. We want to give you an interview because you are a saint. So you, you went to this interview, you went to the studio, and you, you shoot everything and show on the TV. Oh, this guy has achieved samadhi. Well, yes, I have. I have the ability to predict. I have the ability to see your previous life. And then your ego starts to build up, to build up, to build up. And people go to you. Oh, mister, you already have achieved this. And uh, can you help me? Yeah, I can help you. And uh, how much are you going to pay? $10,000 each time? Then you start to... Then you lose everything. You're just putting on a show. So that, you really have to continuously practice to, main, to maintain what you've got. You can easily pollute it. Okay, then you go in the next level now. Okay? So, if you continue, you go to the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, and fourth jhana. That is in a higher level meditation, much higher level. All these, if we don't continue to practice, you will lose them. So it does not mean that you are a saint, you are a saint forever. If you classify, quote unquote, as a saint because you attain this, but if you don't practice it, if you don't have cultivation, you don't have complete elimination, then you still lose it. So you have to keep on doing it. And then you keep on going up, see the arrow? The arrow is pointing up, you go on practicing and practicing. Then you have infinite space jhana, infinite consciousness jhana, no nothingness jhana, neither perception nor non-perception jhana. Now when you're at this level, the samadhi is more than the wisdom. The Buddha was at this level, and at this level, he attained Niroda, attained this Niroda Samadhi and got out of reincarnation. The Buddha at this level, then he got out from all these. Of course, the joy that you have at this level is immeasurable. This is even higher joy. Every one of this level has a higher joy, higher joy. So in other words, all those really experienced meditator, those high-level monks, the way they perceive things are different from us because they are at a very higher level. 
And some of these monks, they achieved very high level and he got sick. He still got sick. His body still got sick. You think he's suffering, but he's not. Only his body appears to be suffering, but he is not suffering. He has a very high level inside. For example, Ajahn Chah, uh, he was sick for a number of years, 15 years, 20 years, but inside is all joy, all enlightenment. The body suffers, but not, not him. His own body suffers, but not him. Okay, given that, then you know where you go, right? Now you know where you go. You know, focus your breath, you know, letting go, you know all these different steps that you have, and once you attain those steps, it does not mean that you get it forever. You still have to continue practicing and practicing until finally you have a complete elimination of mental afflictions, complete cultivation. And then, let's touch on something that meditators are very interested in knowing. This is, these are the results. These are the effects. But what happened? How do I feel when I'm meditating? Do you, know, do you have to know, how do I feel? If I feel this, what does it mean? If I feel joyful, what does it mean? If I feel that I have a tingling of, 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 of feelings in my head on the right-hand side, how does it feel? You have different feelings all the time, right? Generally, there's a certain feelings. The feelings are like this. The five mental factors of the jhanas. You have directed thought, evaluation, or inquiry, stillness of the mind, rapture of joy, and then you also have rapture, and then you also have joy. These are the, the different feelings when you have when you're meditating. Directed thought. Directed thought is you have an object. It means that you keep directing your thoughts to the breath. You are, if I give an example of if I hit the bell, dong. A direct thought is when you first listen to that sound, initial vibration of that sound. If I give an example of a bird flying, the bird before it, it flies, it, it just raises itself and stretch out its wings. It hasn't fly yet. Direct the thought is to stretch out its wings. So we'll, we'll continue next time. So these are the five mental factors, the five feelings. And there's, of course, other feelings too. For example, in the rapture of joy, there is minor rapture, there is monetary rapture, there is rapid rush, there is continuous flow of rapture, there is all pervading or permeating rapture. All these are sensations. Your body are very sensational. Your body starts to move. Your, your, every pore of the skin, skin started to tingle. Every, every pore of the, of the skin have complete vibrations. It's like a wonders. Your body works out wonders when you're, when you're meditating. So this session, I gave you a lot of information. Can you remember all those? Focus on the breath and letting go. And then you know these are the, the, the causes. The effect is you have the, the eight jhanas, the fourth and the fourth. When you are in Dhammadhatu, you don't even call yourself jhana yet. You just call yourself samadhi. You just call yourself kamadhatu samadhi and anagam, anagamya samadhi. You're not even first jhana. If you're really into, into meditation, you don't want to give it up. By the time you feel that, I don't have enough time to do it, I want more time to do it, you are on your way to success. Because you need more time. I meditate for one hour, it's not enough for me. I want it for two hours, it's not enough for me. I've been struggling and got time to do what I want to do. Then you are on your way because it starts to be extremely interesting because you're looking at your own script of life when you're doing meditation. You are looking at yourself. You'll be very interested in looking at yourself. Every inch of yourself, every thought of yourself, it starts to be like, a, like the movie that 
Nowhere else can you see it.